Okay, let's get started. Well, welcome to my talk on developing event-driven microservices with event sourcing and CQRS. And you know, my goal over the next hour uh, in my jet lag state is to sort of show how two really interesting architectural patterns, event sourcing and CQRS, command query responsibility segregation, are a great way to implement microservices. I'm going to sort of show some of the problems that you'll run into if you're building a microservice architecture, and then just show how event sourcing and CQRS are a great way of solving those problems. Um, so before we get into that, a little bit about me. So I actually got my start in programming back in the late 80s, building Lisp systems. Lisp, of course, being one of the very early functional and then object-oriented programming languages. So I worked on compilers and garbage collectors, runtimes, IDEs, and frameworks, and kind of the whole stack. You know, eventually I ended up programming in Java, and then in 2006, my book Pojo's in Action, which was all about building apps with Spring and Hibernate. Um, was published. And then back in 2007, I started playing around with this obscure service known as Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud. You know, it's very much in the early days of EC2, and I'm sure most of you have heard of that now. I ended up creating a startup, Cloud Foundry, which was a Java PaaS for building apps, for deploying apps on Amazon EC2. And then that Cloud Foundry was acquired by SpringSource shortly before SpringSource was acquired by VMware. And so I'd been at VMware for a number of years, left about 18 months ago. And now I'm kind of doing a couple of different things. I'm working on a startup. I'm also doing some consulting around modern application architecture. And I've also created a website, microservices.io, which is a collection of resources that will help you get started designing microservice-based architectures. Um, and a bunch of links. So there's some example code. There's my blog, Plain Old Objects, and also Twitter, where you can follow me. Um, so here's the agenda. So first off, why build event-driven microservices and why event sourcing? Kind of describe a whole set of issues that you need to address. Then explain event sourcing in a lot of detail. Talk about how you go about designing services with event sourcing. And then I'm going to finish up by talking about CQRS. And along the way, I'll explain what all those um, buzzwords mean. So first off, why build event-driven microservices? Um, and sort of kind of what I'm going to explain is kind of like, well, how do you end up with event sourcing um, by going from the traditional monolithic application that uses a relational database through to a microservice architecture with polyglot persistence, and then finally to an event-driven architecture, and then why event sourcing is a good way to, to accomplish that. So, you know, if you're like me, you know, you've probably been building apps that look like this, right? So in this example, it's a um, banking app. So you have a presentation tier. You've got various back-end services. So you've got a nice modular architecture. You might implement it with Spring. The, the, sort of in this art talk, the technology doesn't matter too much. But then when it comes to deploy your application, you actually package everything up inside one WAR file or an ear file if you, if you have to. And then you've got a, you know, you, you serve up HTML JSON to the client. You've got a relational backend. And, um, and so, our, you know, most apps that I've built over the years have looked like this. Just one sort of ha has a monolithic architecture. And the reason for this, right, is they're pretty simple to develop. Our tools work this way. They're pretty straightforward to test. They're also simple to deploy as well. Um, and then relational databases are straightforward. We're familiar with them. They have an ACID transaction semantics, which is a great programming model. Um, and they're easy to scale, right? You just run multiple copies behind a load balancer. Trouble is, um, you know, if you have a team of developers who are busily working away adding code, after some amount of time, you're going to end up with a huge application. And that, this architecture really doesn't scale towards huge applications. You could easily have a million lines of code inside one WAR file. Um, a lot of complexity and so on. 
And there's a whole bunch of different problems with this architecture. So number one, you know, monolithic complex application is very intimidating to developers. It's sort of very difficult to understand and figure out how things work and make changes. Um, tends to be an obstacle to frequent deployments. If you think about the state of the art, it's actually pushing changes into production many times a day. But if you've got this massive monolithic application, it really gets in the way of doing that. You're going to have extensive test cycles and just going to be very time consuming. So the rate at which you can deploy changes into production is likely to be very slow. Um, and also a large application tends to overload your IDE. The more lines of code that you've got sucked into your IDE, the slower it's going to be. Also, the larger the application, the, the longer it is it's going to take to start up. You know, I used to think you know, it was problematic when applications would take, say, three minutes to start up. But I've, you know, in talking with people, it turns out that some applications take as long as 40 minutes. And if that's part of your development cycle, you're really not going to be very productive, right? You make a change, you start up the server, and then you wait a long time. And then you try it, see whether you fix the bug, and you, and you haven't, so you kind of have to keep going around and around that cycle. It's not a very productive way of working. Also, a large monolithic application tends to get in the way of um, scaling development. You know, each team, each functional team, like the UI team, the back-end team, want to be able to push their changes into production independently. But if they all have to put their code together inside a war, a lot of communication and coordination is required. Like, the UI team might want to push their changes, but then it turns out the back-end team has, has, has actually broken the build. And then also, a monolithic application tends to force you into a long-term relationship with the technology choices that you made at the start of the project. So you end up with this large, complex app that's difficult to understand, difficult to deploy, and then it's using some legacy technology that, that no one really wants to work with. Anyone here in, in that boat? Just checking. Um, so what can you do about it? And oh, of course, then the, the other problem, of course, is um, relational databases also have their own limitations as well, like they're difficult to scale. Um, you tend to only be able to scale them vertically, which gets prohibit prohibitively expensive. They also tend to um, be difficult to sort of distribute across multiple data centers. Schema updates tend to be a problem as well, handling semi-structured data. So it's sort of both the monolithic application combined with a relational database tends to have a whole set of problems. Um, and so what can you do about it? Well, the solution, of course, is to apply the scale cube, which is this great three-dimensional model of scalability from the book, The Art of Scalability, and apply y-axis or functional decomposition, which actually breaks things apart, and then also apply z-axis or data partitioning, where, such as database sharding, where you're using, say, the primary key of a row to decide which server that row should reside on. So once you've applied both those, kind, those two scaling approaches, you end up with both a microservice architecture, where now you've got little standalone applications for each functional area of your application, each one of which has its own database, and then you also apply those scaling patterns to the database layer as well. So you end up with functionally decomposed um, databases, so orders in one database, um, customers in another. And then also you're doing sharding as well. And then the other thing you can do is apply NoSQL databases. And so if you want to do you know, text search, you use Cloud Search or Elasticsearch. If you have storing graph data, you use a graph database like Neo4j. And so on. So it sort of radically changes how you um, architect your application. Not only that, each, diff each module or each service in your application can actually use a different kind of database. So it's sort of got, we've gone a long way from a monolith talking to a single relational database. So now we're in the realm of microservices and polyglot persistence. So we kind of, you know, seen problems with the monolith. We've solved that by turning it into microservices. We've seen problems with the relational database, and now we're using polyglot persistence. 
So we're kind of working our way towards why event sourcing. But the interesting thing is about this new architecture is that now we've got a whole bunch of distributed data management problems, right? So let's imagine that you're using MySQL to store products, but you're using Elasticsearch to do text search. The challenge here, of course, is that whenever MySQL is updated, you also have to update Elasticsearch as well. So how can you kind of maintain consistency across those two different databases? Likewise, if you're using a NoSQL database like Mongo or Cassandra, where you can't actually have a transaction that lets you update two different entities atomically, you know, we've got another sort of problem there. Or same, same in, in Cassandra, and maintaining index tables and denormalized views and the like. And you even have the same problem with relational databases where because you functionally decompose things and sharded them, you have different entities scattered around in different databases and for various reasons you, you don't want to use two-phase commit. So there's sort of all these problems um, with that approach. And that then leads us to an event-driven architecture. And the big idea here is, is that when you know, one component, one service changes its database, it publishes an event, other services can consume those events and update their own databases. So we use events to drive changes across multiple databases and multiple, um, um, across multiple databases and multiple services within the architecture. So for example, when, you know, saying that we've got a catalog service and someone creates a product, we insert a row into MySQL, and we publish an event to the message bus saying the product was created, the search service can consume that event and update Elasticsearch and create a document and add it and, and index it. Um, likewise, if we're doing money transfer across all of these different databases, we can accomplish that by using an event-driven workflow where we create a money transfer object that publishes an event um, saying money transfer was created, the account service can consume that event and debit the from account, which in turn causes it to publish an event saying the account was debited, which can then get consumed by the money transfer service, which can then record the fact that the from account was debited, which then publishes events and so on. So you have these events sort of bouncing back and forth between these two different services, which ultimately causes money to be transferred. And all of this is done without actually using two-phase commit. Um, so that, that's good. We're going to use events to keep, um, to men maintain consistency. The challenge, though, of course, is that we're now we need to atomically publish an event whenever a domain object changes. Um, and it's like, well, how do we do that? So one option, of course, is to use two-phase commit. But that's sort of exactly the kind of approach that we're trying to avoid, right? Um, I mean, obviously, it would work, except that now you need a distributed transaction manager and you need to use technologies, the database and the message broker that both support two-phase commit, and, but it impacts reliability of your system and it's just sort of in today's kind of web scale world, two-phase commit is just very much out of fashion and, and is best avoided. Another approach which was adopted by eBay is actually to use the underlying database as also, also as a message queue. So within one transaction, you can update, say, an, an account object and insert an event into an event table. To, um, so we're sort of doing an update and a publish. And then in another transaction, we can consume that event. And then in a third transaction, we can mark that event as consumed. So that's sort of how eBay kind of works with sharded and partitioned databases. Um, but it kind of relies on you having a, a, using a SQL database to do that. And it doesn't actually work with NoSQL. And I, there's a bunch of design issues around that. So, so it's kind of like, well, we want to use events. But then the actual way with which we implement events is kind of problematic. And that kind of leads you to event sourcing, which is kind of you know, the essence of what this talk is about.
So we've kind of got this quite sophisticated partitioned architecture that's event driven and then I'm going to show how event sourcing is the way that you implement that ev the event driven mechanism. So the big idea with event sourcing is that for each of the entities, the key entities or aggregates in the domain model, you identify the, the state changing domain events and you explicitly model them as event classes. So for an account, we would have an account opened event, an account debited event, and an, and an account credited event, and so on. So we actually have to explicitly think about all of the events that can occur and cause the state of our entities to change. So that, that in itself is not, not particularly revolutionary. But there where, then where it, where it gets really interesting is actually how you persist the state of your entities. So rather than actually storing the current state, so for example, having an account table uh, with a balance column, instead what we do is just store, for each entity, you store the sequence of state changing events so for an account, you would actually have an account opened event and then one or more credit and debited events. You actually store the events instead of the current state. And then whenever you want to reconstruct the current state of an entity, you actually load those events and replay them. So it's all about storing events rather than current state. And where that gets kind of really interesting is that in, in relevant to this architecture is so whereas before we were update we had to figure out how to update state and publish events now all we're ever doing is persisting events which kind of implies that they're being published as well and that's a single action that can be done atomically so it's it's a great way of, of implementing this event driven architecture without having to use two phase commit or any other complex mechanism. And so in, that, in a system like this, the way events or requests get processed, right, so an HTTP request comes in um, to update an entity, so we find that entity's events. We, with the, using the entity's default constructor, we create a blank instance of that entity. And then we replay the events, which reconstitutes the current state. And then we process the command that's derived from the request, which actually results in new events that then get saved in the event store. So it's a very event-centric way of implementing your business logic. And then what's um, extra interesting is on the other side, you can have other services can subscribe to those events. And, when, and then they get notified that some event has occurred and they themselves can then go update other aggregates which would trigger further events or update some kind of um, view table, a materialized or denormalized view such as update Elasticsearch for example. Um, and there's sort of various diff you know, different implementations of the event store. I think many folks have actually implemented this mechanism themselves, sort of a do-it-yourself approach. Off in .NET land, there's get event store by Greg Young. And I'm actually building an event store and I'm kind of looking for people to try it out. So please ping me if, if you're interested. Um, so you might be wondering, well, if I, you know, this is great, but what if I have an account that's been open for a very long time? That's a very large number of, of events to load from the database and replay. And the standard approach here of, is actually to periodically create snapshots of the current aggregate state and save those in the event store. And so it's sort of a memento pattern in essence. So that means in order to reconstruct the current state, you find the most recent snapshot and then find the, the events that have occurred since that snapshot and replay those. So you never have to go back to the beginning of time and, and process, say, thousands of debits and credits. Um, so in terms of what does the code look like, I've actually got two different styles of code. So one of them is sort of a more traditional OO functional kind of code where your domain objects have to implement an interface. So this is, I've got some, uh, the examples are in Scala here, but there's also a Java version as well. So, the, so you've got a, an, apply, an aggregate interface, 
that has an, a play event method that takes an event and returns a copy of the entity that's been updated with that event. So if, it, if the event was account credited, then the, it would return an account whose balance field had been incremented by, by, the, amount of, uh, by the amount of money. And then there's also a command processing aggregate that extends aggregate and ad adds a process command method that takes a command and gives you back a sequence of events. So that, that's kind of the essence of how these entities work in, in the system. They they, you can mutate them by getting back an updated copy by applying events. And then you can process commands which give you the events that you can then apply. Um, so here's an, here's an example of an account. And you can see there's a process command method that uses a Scala, um, it's using Scala pattern matching, which is basically a sophisticated switch statement that says if it's an open account command, return an account opened event. If it's a credit account command, return an account credited event. And then the debit case is a little bit more interesting because you have to do an overdraft check. But hopefully you get, get the idea. And then here's the apply event method that's using pattern matching as well. And you can see if it's an, uh, an account opened event, it actually calls copy, which is like clone in Java, um, except that it sort of works in a much more useful way. And it just creates a, an in, a copies and sets the balance to the initial balance, whereas the debit event subtracts from the balance and the credit event adds to the balance. Um, so it's a very different style. So these domain objects are, are immutable. They never actually, they, they never get updated in place. You're always returning a modified copy of the domain object. And here's the API for the event store. So it's got methods like save to save a new entity, update to update an existing one, and then some fine methods. Um, but I also got a much more functional approach, which kind of has some similar interfaces, except that they actually separate out the, the state from the behavior. So whereas in OO, you always have state and behavior mixed together with the functional approach, you have state and then in one class and behavior in another. Um, so here's the same um, kind of a version of a money transfer where there's the state, which is just a simple class that's a collection of fields, and then all the behavior for money transfer is in a separate um, class. So it's kind of, which sort of behaves like a strategy object. And the event store has a slightly different interface, but kind of the same conceptual methods. Um, so that, that's kind of the essence of what event sourcing is about. And there's a bunch of benefits to, to doing this. So number one, there's actually, you get a built-in audit log, right? If you think about it, when, whenever the state of an entity changes, it has to be done through an event. So you're guaranteed to actually kind of have an audit log of who did what when. It's not something that gets bolted on afterwards. So that's kind of a big benefit. It also enables temporal queries. So because we're actually saving the history, you can go back in time and see what is the state of this entity at some point in the past. Um, and that's quite, you know, quite difficult to do in the traditional approach where you're always storing the current state. Um, and then another benefit is, is that we're actually publishing events that can then be consumed by you know, sort of machine learning algorithms, right? That are sort of built updating models of, of um, how users behave and, and showing personalized content and so on. And then it also kind of preserves the history of everything that's happened in the system, which actually lets you in the future implement new features as, as if you had implemented them in the past because you've got everything that has happened in the past and you can run that through the, the implementation of the new feature. Uh, and so it kind of lets you build systems that sort of more easily implement unanticipated requirements. And then on top of that, there's a whole bunch of technical benefits as well, right? So it sort of solves the data consistency issues in microservice or polyglot persistent architectures because you you're atomically saving and publishing events and you've got subscribers and so on. 
And then it also eliminates the OR mapping problem. You think about, you know, even today, it's quite challenging to map a complex domain model to a relational schema. Well, the neat thing about this approach is that you, never, you, you don't do that mapping. The only thing you ever have to do is serialize the events, which for most domains, the events are very, very simple, and you can trivially serialize them. So it kind of, for the most part, so, you know, eliminates any issues around OR mapping. There are some downsides, of course, of event sourcing, right? So number one, you know, it's, it's weird and unfamiliar. We're not used to writing business logic in this way. So it can take a little bit of getting used to. Um, also, the events, once you've, create, once you've saved them, stick around forever. So you can think of them as sort of like they can end up being a historical record of all of your bad design decisions. So what, what's really nice is that for the most part, the events are very much sort of rooted in the actual problem domain. They're things that the domain experts generally understand. And so you're much more likely to get them right as opposed to something in the solution space where, you know, that sort of programmer cre creativity and, and, and oriented. So for the most part, it, it's fairly straightforward to get your events right. Um, you know, there is a problem, you know, with any message-oriented system is there's always the possibility of duplicate events. And so you have to put in place mechanisms to, uh, to detect duplicate events um, and sort of ig generally ignore them or design the, um, the event handlers to be item potent. So there's, there's some challenges there. And then another issue is the, the, end, the, the application has to hand, be prepared to deal with eventually consistent data, data because you might change something over there and then act, so you make a request to a service over there and then you query a service over here and the events haven't flowed um, through the system yet. There's always the equivalent of a replication lag. So that's a challenge. And then another complica complication is that the event store only supports primary key-based lookup of entities, like as in, give me the events for this entity. And so it doesn't support arbitrary queries. And that's actually where CQRS comes in. And I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. OK, so what does it look like you know, when you're designing systems with event sourcing? And there's actually two different levels of design. There's the strategic level, and then there's the tactical level. So, and so with the strategic design, you're really focused on identifying the services. So it's for my given problem domain, what services should I use to um, kind of implement that, that a solution? And then the tactical domain is side of things is, a, is oriented around designing the individual services. So we're thinking about strategic domain, there's sort of two scenarios, right? One is where you've got a brand new project. And there it's like, well, we've got this domain, the, you know, which is what's our business. Um, in this case, it's banking. Well, you can actually break that up into various subdomains, right? Customer management, transactions, account management, and so on. And then you can kind of turn those into in domain-driven design is called a bounded context, which is sort of the areas within which a given domain model applies. And those, those bounded contexts basically become your microservices, or at least the first approximation of your microservices. I think you, you can end up having to iterate a few times. And then, you, you know, once you've identified your microservices, you kind of have to think about, well, what are the different communication mechanisms between the services? And there's sort of two different patterns, right? So service X reads from service Y. So one option there, it can make an RPC call, HTTP GET, to retrieve some data. Or service X can subscribe to events published by service Y and kind of keep track of what of the state changes that are happening inside Y. And then another kind of, coll uh, of collaboration is that service X wants to update service Y. 
And that, of course, you know, with, with two phase, without two-phase commit can't be done with RPC. And so that's where service Y has to consume the events, has to subscribe to the events that are being published by service X. So when X changes, Y gets notified and can update itself in order to be consistent. Um, so that's kind of you know, what's going on at the strategic level when you're building a new application. The other scenario, of course, is when you're, you've got an existing monolith and you want to migrate to a microservice architecture. So one strategy there is whenever you implement new functionality, implement it as a, uh, as a standalone service and then write what's called an anti-corruption layer, which is basically glue code to connect the monolith with that service. So your new code always ends up in this nice sort of clean, pristine, service-oriented world. And then you've got this glue code that's sort of dealing with the ugliness of connecting the old and the new. You can also, you know, in, within, you can also identify existing chunks of functionality within your monolith and then actually extract that out as a standalone service with once again having some glue code to tie the two together. And if you do that enough times, then your monolith will gradually disappear and you will just be left with a collection of services. So that's sort of what's going on strategically. And then at the, ta at the tactical level, you know, here you're using the familiar building blocks of domain-driven design. So you, th you have to think about your entities, you have to think about value objects, you have to think about services and also consider repositories as well. So that's sort of a much more familiar world. And then, but then a key thing that you have to do is actually partition your domain model within each service into aggregates, which are little sort of clusters of objects. So they're, they're, they're sort of the top level entities like order and, and shopping cart, um, a bank account, and so on. And then you, you, do the, you apply the event-driven design strategy and, ev and, and identify the state-changing events for each aggregate. So we've sort of gone from big picture down to the service level, and then within the service, we're thinking about the individual aggregates and figuring out what events they should have, right? And you, you know, when you're designing events, you kind of have to think about the naming, which tends to be in the past tense. You also have to think about what attributes the events have. Um, and then there's an interesting issue is do you, do you have just sort of minimal attributes in the events, or do you actually include extra data in the event that, that's needed by the, any consumers of the event. There's sort of this in, uh, concept of, of, of enriched events that you have to think about. Um, and then the individual services, you know, each service ends up hosting one or more aggregates. There are various adapters in the service that are taking incoming requests, HTTP requests or, or um, messages over an enterprise enterprise message bus, turning them into commands which are getting processed by the aggregate, and then that's generating events that are saved into the event store. And then there's also an event adapter that's subscribing to events um, and then turning those into commands as well. And, you know, here's some example code. So here's a Spring MVC controller, and it's written in a reactive style, so there's sort of an kind of, it's a little bit more complex than you, than you might think, but basically it's just calling, you know, you do a post to the transfers URL, and then that ends up invoking the money transfer service, which is actually, a, which is an asynchronous service that returns a future. Now here's the actual service itself, and the actual transfer money method is written in terms of this little Scala DSL. So it's saying, create a new entity called money transfer and have it process a money transfer command. And under the covers, the DSL is actually creating a new aggregate, processing the commands, and then actually persisting the, the commands in the event store. But all of that boilerplate is just hidden, hidden from you using the DSL. And then the other thing that you have to do is if, define event handlers to subscribe to events that are being published by other entities. And so in this case, here's the ha handler for a account debited event, 
that is saying update the existing entity of type money transfer identified by the events transaction ID and have it by having it process the record debit command. So once again under the covers is actually loading the aggregate and reconstituting its current state, processing the commands and persisting the events in the event store. But, that, but all of that boilerplate is being hidden away. So that, that's kind of what you know, the apps that I've been working on recently look like. So it's quite different from the traditional sort of Spring MVC or sort of Hibernate based or JPA based apps. I'm actually still using Spring to wire everything together, but the whole structure of the domain logic is different and obviously the persistence mechanism is, is different as well. Um, so I kind of want to finish up by um, talking about how queries are implemented in an event sourced um, application. Because you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, the event store only supports lookup by primary key. But if you think about it, um, you know, to, in order to sort of view, display a page in the application, you typically have to do a query. You're effectively executing queries that do joins across multiple um, entities. So let's imagine that you want to display an account and its most recent transactions, right? I mean, that, that sort of logically, I think you're basically doing an outer join between accounts, um, between mo and between money transfers, uh, and so on. But you can't do those kinds of queries with the event store, right? It only by itself supports primary key-based lookup. And so in order to implement those kinds of queries, you have to implement, or you have to use another pattern, which is CQRS, or Command Query Responsibility Segregation. So the idea there is, is that instead of having a single component in your application handle both updates or commands and queries, the, the um, HTTP gets, you actually split your system into two pieces. So you have the command side that's processing updates, which is basically what I've talked about up until this point. So it's processing commands, saving events in the event store. And then you have an entirely separate query side that, that's handling the, well, concretely, the HTTP GET request to, to get the data um, to display on pages. And the way those two um, parts of your application communicate, of course, is via events that are being saved and published via the event store. So when the command side process updates an entity, it's saving events, and then the query side is subscribing to those events and maintaining one or more denormalized views of the data using a data store that supports the kinds of queries that, that you that you need to act to run against it. So it's sort of a kind of a, quite an intra different approach where you're separating things out. So in terms of microservices, what does this look like? Well, you've got actually two. So one is you have an updater service that's subscribing to events coming out of the event store and then updating some kind of view data store. And that view data store could be Mongo, it could be Neo4j, or it could be a text search engine like Cloud Search or Elasticsearch. Um, it really does depend on the kinds of queries that, that you need to support. And it could actually be an SQL database as well. Um, it just really depends on the data access patterns that, you, that um, the view side needs to support. And then there's a view query service that's handling the HTTP GET request by querying the view store. Um, and that, that, that's kind of the es essence of the, of the CQRS pattern. And so in the example code that I've written um, that you can find in GitHub, um, basically the, the view side is maintaining in MongoDB a document for every account and that document lists all of the recent debits and credits, the changes that have been applied to that account, plus this, a sequence of all of the transfers that have, been, that have impacted that account in some way, either transferred money in or transferred money out. 
plus it actually stores the current balance as well. So you can imagine when you're in order to render a web page that's showing the account, the current balance, the recent transactions, you just have to load this document from MongoDB, which is super efficient, and render the HTML. So you end up with a very sort of data, sort of, um, data store that's just optimized for efficiently supporting um, that particular UI design. And so the code kind of looks something like this, where there's just a bunch of event handlers that are calling, that are actually updating MongoDB. Um, and then in the apps that I've worked on, I've also used some other views. So there's like, I, I've been using Cloud Search, which is Amazon's hosted text search engine. So whenever an entity changes, um, the corresponding document inside Cloud Search gets re-indexed. Um, and then I've also been using DynamoDB to support views as, as well. So that's Amazon's hosted NoSQL solution. And they, and they both worked quite well. So, you know, there's a bunch of benefits and drawbacks to using CQRS, right? So number one, if you're using event sourcing, you have to use, C, you almost always have to use CQRS to support the queries required by the UI. The CQRS also, by separating the command side from the query side, tends to make each one of them simpler. And then it also has the interesting effect that you can actually have multiple views, right? So you could have events flowing into Neo4j to support graph queries, and then events also flowing into MongoDB to support sort of document style access as well. Um, so you can support a, a broad set of queries by using multiple view databases. So you can end up with a very nice scalable um, performance solution. So there are some downsides, right? There's complexity. You know, there's just, you know, we're, we've come a long way from just sort of a monolithic application talking to a single relational database. There's also potential code duplication. Maybe the code has to be duplicated between the command side and the view side. And then, of course, there's the potential for replication lag as well, whereby, you know, so the UI makes a request to update some entity and then does a get which goes to the view to retrieve what it thinks should be the updated version of that entity. But, you know, there's always a replication lag, so it's possible that when the UI goes and retrieves the updated view, it actually gets the old version. Um, so you have to kind of code in a way that takes that into account. So one option is the UI, say if you're just running, you know, it's um, a rich client, JavaScript client running in a browser, the UI can just update the local browser um, data model of what's on the server side under the assumption that the update will complete. And so you're basically faking it in the, in the UI with the understanding that by the time the user actually navigates away from that page and then navigates back, the, the replication of the data will have happened. And that, that tends to work pretty well. Okay, so that, that's sort of my talk, right? So kind of the key ideas is that event sourcing solves key data consistency issues with, my, with, with microservice services and also with kind of modern polyglot persistent partition database architectures. And you want to apply DDD both strategically and tactically. So you apply strategic DDD to, uh, to identify the microservices and then tactical DDD to design the individual services. And then you use CQRS to implement materialized views for all the various queries that you need to support. So it's kind of a quite, quite a different approach from the traditional monolith relational database architecture. So anyway, that, that's my talk. Um, I hope that you found it useful. Please follow me on Twitter, send me email, check out my blog, check out microservices.io. So thank you.